now really excited to turn it over to Dre Alston, who will be introducing our pan panelists. Excellent. Yes. Hi, Dr. Alt. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Dre. I use they, them pronouns, and uh, I am one of the ed equity mentors, and I will be introducing the panelists. So uh, first we have, let me pull it up on my phone super, super quick. Okay. Uh, Susanna Paras. Uh, Susana um, is LCSW, um, or has an LCSW, and is the founder and executive director of Heal Together Mental Wellness Services in Inglewood, California. She received her MSW from UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs. As a daughter of Guatemalan Im immigrants, mother, partner, and a mental health therapist of color, she dedicates pr providing therapy through an anti-racist lens as a form of activism, specializing in the intersectional integration of critical race practices within clinical settings and for POC grounded organizations. She has previously taught as an adjunct instructor at Cal State Dominguez Hills, teaching critical race theory and social work, and will be teaching in the social work department at UCLA in the winter. Welcome. Okay, and then Dr. Ebony Perez um, is a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work and received her PhD from the University of South Florida. She currently serves as an assistant professor of social work and undergraduate department chair at St. Leo University, utilizing qualitative, qualitative methodologies and critical and race-based theories her research agenda seeks to understand the nuances and complexities of the role of social work educators in preparing future practitioners for anti-racist praxis. Furthermore, Dr. Perez's research and scholarship aims to advance inclusive and transformative policies and practices within social work education. Welcome. Uh, Nicole Vas Vasquez is an expert in the practical application of critical race theory in academic and professional settings with an emphasis on social work practice. She has over 20 years experience both in the public and nonprofit sectors that includes work with elected officials in government agencies and in grassroots organizations. Her direct practice experience includes crisis counseling and home counseling and case management. Nicole most recently served as a director of field education and chair designee in California State University Dominguez Hills Master of Social Work program. A seasoned and skilled facilitator, Nicole conducts critical race specific trainings within university departments with public and nonprofit sector clients and social work professionals in addition to providing consultation in organizational development and support through CRS frame as a principal at Vesquez Counseling. Welcome, sorry. Um, and then Lauren Wilner, Dr. Lauren Wilner. Um, she is from California State University, Northridge. Dr. Wilner completed her PhD in social welfare at UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs in 2017. Her research focuses on the nonprofit sector, specifically social justice and social change organizations. Social justice is at the forefront of Dr. Wilner's research and practice, and she's committed to garnering greater understanding about how the models that nonprofit organizations embrace can be strengthened to achieve greater positive results for clients and communities. By conducting research that favors an interdisciplinary and critical approach to organizational inquiry, Dr. Wilner's research builds upon existing knowledge and generates new understandings about the role of nonprofit organizations in working together towards greater social justice. She is currently researching how nonprofits utilize business models typically employed for the, by the for-profit sector and the impact of this trend on the abilities of social justice organizations to effect effectively provide services, meet the needs of clients, and work towards greater social justice and social change. Her other research interests include anti-oppressive social work research and practice and social work pedagogy informed by critical, theory, critical theoretical approaches. 
She is a qualitative researcher and has a particular interest in community-based research methodologies. Dr. Wilner earned her MSW from the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice in 2009 and a Bachelor's in Feminist Studies and Photojournalism from um, Gallatin School in, in New York in 2004. Welcome. Thank you, Dre, for the introductions. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and give the um, panelists the time to introduce um, themselves as well. So um, one, one second, Maribel. Uh, we're going to do the, I'm going to explain the Q&A really quick in the chat and then okay, we'll, we'll do, yeah. So um, I'm going to be um, collecting Q&A questions in the chat um, that we have the panelists answer afterwards. Um, to do so, please, in all caps, write the word uh, STACK and then put your question in all caps. Please do not do this if you don't want your question collected in the Q&A. Please do not type in all caps, um, even if you're very excited. Um, so please just use all caps for questions. I will be collecting them and then filtering through to make sure we don't get double questions and things of that nature. And we will be asking the panelists their questions do not direct message me. You don't have to do that. Just leave your leave the question in the chat. Okay. Is that explained? Does anyone have any questions as a, the stack method? Okay, cool. Okay, now, now Maribel. Thank you. Well, thank you. So my name is Maribel Mendoza. I am a social work student in the um in my second year of graduation with the for, with the master's um program so i'm gonna go ahead and allow um our panelists to introduce to briefly introduce themselves um so if you want to go first uh, whoever wants to go first could go ahead and and welcome themselves We could also start with um, Dr. Paris, if that's okay. Oh, that works. Thank you, Maribel. I appreciate the introduction. Dre, thank you so much um, for that beautiful introduction that you have given to all of us um, this morning, or rather this afternoon for those of us who are on the East Coast. Um, so I apologize, that is my dog who just decided to bark right now. But anywho. Um, so with regards to who I am, I am Dr. Ebony Perez. I am the undergraduate social work chair at St. Leo University. And I have been there for about six years now um, and have been the chair of the department since 2019. And so for me, um, when it comes to critical race theory, uh, one of the things that I would say about critical race theory or CRT is that it's one of the ways that I really choose to acknowledge how we live in a really rapidly changing world and the complexity of social progress that has grown exponentially. And so our strategies must be innovative and unapologetic about the history and the impact of racism, as well as the importance of cultural identity, self reflexive self-reflectivity and the interactions and intersections of race, class, and gender. And through that, um, I really look to provide liberatory practices in both pedagogical uh, strategies in the classroom. I also make a commitment to challenge dominant ideologies out there. And so I am very outspoken about my commitment to social justice. And therefore, in the spaces that I occupy, I tend to bring up issues of social justice when, you know, otherwise they may go unnoticed. And so that could look like being in the classroom and a student make a comment or ask a question or it could even be in you know, a meeting in the spaces that students aren't necessarily invited into. I feel like that part of our job as educators are to bring in student voices into those spaces as well. And I really take that opportunity and have that commitment to social justice and moving towards a more equitable practice and more equitable policies no matter where I am. So 
as I like to say, and um, folks who get to know me have heard me say often, I tend to take care of my part of the ocean and make sure it is as clean as possible and encourage others to do the same. Thank you, Dr. Paris. Now, um, Susanna. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you. And um, yes, to uh, thank you for that introduction, um, Ebony. I, I am Susana Victoria Parras, and I am uh, really learning uh, my experience and um, responsibility as a settler of color on Tongva land, um, also known as Los Angeles. And more specifically, um, my, my, my home in this moment is in South Central Los Angeles. This is where my family is. This is where I work. Um, this is where I, where I do everything that I do currently. And um, I, um, I will kind of just take you through, you know, some of the, the places that, I, that I've been. Um, and I started with really, you know, I want to acknowledge um, my pre-social work, um, my, you know, which is really formative, you know, really formative experience for me around uh, being a substitute teacher and, and a tutor. And really before that, being a student of ethnic studies at UCSD. And and just you know I can go even before that but but just really wanting to acknowledge those those moments in time because they're really um, um they they really um uh, help me navigate um a lot of what I what I now know to navigate and I am currently a, a community therapist um in in my own practice um and I really as a consultant I re I'm really trying to navigate um the the nonprofit. Um, you know, uh, world now as a consultant and really supporting um, with healing justice, um, you know, liberatory transformative um, ways of being. And so CRT really is, is one tool for me, um, one tool of, of endless tools um, that I have learned. And uh, I really then after that was, uh, came into internship. So my, my heart is, is in schools. Um, my heart is in schools and, and I began at Long Beach um, in, in K through 12. And then I was also an intern at a psychiatric unit in Long Beach, um, uh, excuse me, in San Pedro. And um, I then went on to, you know, to be a, a school social worker through a DMH uh, organization in Santa Monica. Um, I then moved on to create a mental health program at a high school um, in a, a El Rancho school district um, in, in Los Angeles. And I'm in private practice and really just all those histories, all those places really served um, for me to define and redefine uh, my practice and, and really shape what it would be moving forward. So in all of that is really the relationships. It's really the people. Um, and some of those people that I, you know, in these um, are here, you know, that are here with and that I experienced these moments with. And so for me, it's really, you know, how I implement, you know, CRT really comes from a very intimate, from a very personal place. Um, it, it comes, you know, it, it comes in, in these very expansive ways now, it's endless. And so for me, I, I, I use CRT as a tool um, as an approach um, and as a way of being in the world, um, very similarly to how um, Ebony um, shared with us. It's a theory of critique um, and it's also a demand for justice and a refusal, um, a refusal to accept um, these realities that have now become normalized in many ways. Violence has become normalized. And so to all of that, um, really CRT is one of my many allies, my accomplices. And so I really have a relationship with these theories um, because it's it's through the people that this that I've been able to implement and really work with CRT. Um, I've implemented it in clinical groups. I've created content with CRT. I've taught um, through a CRT lens. Um, I do very personal and deep work through a CRT lens um, and really a, a understanding it as, as healing work. Um, immigrant health work, I've, I've implemented in universities and in school settings in, 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 in all sorts of meetings with parents, with principals, with colleagues um, and, and and really experienced um, a lot of the pushback around that as well. Um, and, and now just a lot of the flourishing and abundance that has come with really implementing this work through um, relationship building. And I can speak more about um, more of my specific work later. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, we'll go ahead and go with Nicole. 
Right, thank you. Um, it's so amazing to be in this space with these um, beautiful, wonderful practitioners. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, I um, am an MSW MPP um, from UCLA. Uh, at UCLA, when I was a grad student, the MPP is a master in public policy, just as an FYI. Um, when I was at UCLA, I was part of a student-initiated, student-led course in critical race theory in public affairs. And I was part of the inaugural class. Um, and so again, it was student initiated and student led. So they created the syllabus. They, I'm saying, because there were another group of students who led the effort and they created the syllabus. And it was the hardest class that I took both academically and emotionally. Um, and I united Lauren and, and Susanna took the class as well. So that was my introduction was, was in grad school. Um, and, and I've, lived my life through a CRT lens since because and I know like, you know, the Dominguez students um, and alum that are here, um, you know, I've heard them share that like once you're exposed to CRT, like there's no other way to see the world. Um, I say that CRT courses through my veins. Um, so if we and I think for some folks, it's thank you for doing the poll earlier, because I think, I um, mean, you know, I have a sense in terms of like, who uh, is relatively new to CRT. Some people, it seemed like most people have a little bit of an understanding of it. And really for me, what CRT does, and I think kind of like Susanna too, it, it's like a starting point. Um, so like once you, thanks for bringing the poll back up. Um, once you have an understanding or once we have an understanding of the tenets, once we recognize and understand that um, racism or uh, race is socially constructed, other markers of identity are socially constructed. And then in turn, racism is ordinary. It happens every single day. It's endemic. It's um, you know ingrained in the fabric of this country as are other isms like um, homophobia, transphobia, sexism. Once we understand that like, okay, and we understand where it comes from, how it's rooted, how it's perpetuated daily then I think that we have that fundamental level of understanding to, to take it from there and then to go in and do our work. So I think one of the questions we're supposed to answer is like, how do you incorporate it into our work? Well, again, because like there's no other way now for me to see the world. Um, anytime I purchase it, in, in, and, and I will say that I have the luxury of being able to choose the, the projects and even you know before I started doing consulting work like I chose to go to Dominguez like I chose to work at community coalition before that like I chose agencies that I knew that it were aligned with um, my principles and had that fundamental level of understanding that race is socially constructed racism is ordinary and we're operating from that as a foundation to move forward um, so I'm very intentional in, in terms of the the spaces that I choose to work in. Um, and I'll say that the tenants really guide me um, in, in being able to, to approach my work. Um, and I think, you know, I'm always going to go back to um, my sister, Susanna, that how, like, for me, and I'll be honest, like, when I was first introduced to CRT, um, I was very separated from, because CRT also focuses on systems and institutions. And the goal is systemic and institutional change. And I'm a macro level social worker and I'm, you know, I'm all about systems and moving systems and policies. Um, and I've, and I had separated myself, separated that from the personal. And I would say just like in the last couple of years, I've moved into like, what does that mean for me as a person? Um, so I just got the, the, the note to, to move on. So I'm going to move on. I am so sorry for that, but thank you, Nicole. It's so great to have you here. And now I'm gonna go ahead and let Dr. Wilner introduce um, themselves and we will move on. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I am so honored uh, to be here with all of you and with these other incredible panelists um, who I just feel so incredibly honored and blessed to, to share space with today. Um, I'm Dr. Lauren Wilner. I am an assistant professor at San Diego State University. I was at CSUN for the last three years. Um, and before that, I was at UCLA, Western School of Public Affairs, doing my doctoral work, um, which is how I know Susan. Um, and we, um, I know a lot of these people from various um, connections uh, throughout our, our journey and using CRT and social work. So it's lovely to see all of, all of your faces here. Um, for me, um, CRT has been, um, I was introduced to it 
without actually really knowing it in undergrad. Um, and then, you know, as someone who was um, a, a feminist studies major um, and really went in um, trying to do work um, around uh, gender inequity, um, it quickly became very apparent to me that the feminist movement was inherently racist. Um, and that I needed to grapple with that, particularly as a white woman. Um, I sit in a very different space um, as, you know, a lot of different people using CRT. Um, as a white woman, um, CRT has really given me a language to be able to um, not just understand what my role um, as an, a white individual has been um, in perpetuating systemic racism and systemic injustice, um, but also a way to talk with others about it. Um, so I use CRT as a way to, um, I have an access to people um, that is not perhaps granted to others simply because of my privilege. And um, in some spaces, people are more likely to listen to me because of that. And so I use CRT um, to my advantage in that respect. And I love it because what it does is allows me to remove, you know, um, so often when we're talking about um, issues of racism and issues of privilege, when you're talking to a bunch of white people, they're all like, nah, not me, not me, I ain't racist, you know? Um, and it's a very individualized thing and rightfully so. Nobody wants to be accused of being racist even if they know in their heart that they're racist. And that's, that's okay, right? What CRT allows me to do is really remove it for the moment from the personal to allow people to take a step back and understand how we all have biases and we all are guilty of perpetuating inequity in some way, shape or form. And that that's not actually our fault as an individual. There are systems that have been in place from the moment this country was founded that make sure that that continues to happen. And again, as a white female identified individual, I am able to walk into those spaces and demand a certain degree of respect, so to speak, that is often not um, afforded to um, people of color, um, particularly um, on the part of, of other white folks. And so I try to use it in that way, in addition to um, also using it, again, it's, it's a life view. It, it literally changed my world as I went in um, to thinking about, you know, very long time ago in undergrad, um, I'm not even gonna tell you how long ago that was. Um, you know, thinking about how to be the best feminist I could possibly be and having my world turned upside down when everyone in, in the classes, you know, I'm taking classes. Um, there's this one class that stands out for me called, um, it was called Women of Color, colon, the politics of experience. And here I am in this class, I'm this, you know, young idealist, this, you know, girl coming with so much privilege. And I was, I was a young girl at that time, um, coming with, with so much privilege and had no idea. And I had, quite frankly, my ass handed to me on a platter. And it was the best experience I ever had. And um, it was all done through a lens of CRT. And from that moment, my whole world changed. And I was able to really shift my perspective and do some introspective work and then think about how I was going to use this in my future. And from that moment on, that's what I did. I use it in practice. I use it in, reach it, in research. Um, it is my theoretical framework that I do my research from. I am... Um, a researcher by trade. And so um, I, again, I, I study the nonprofit sector and I use CRT to understand the ways in which um, our nonprofit sector, um, however well-intentioned is um, perpetuating systems of inequity and, and systemic racism in a lot of, of different ways. And I also use it in my teaching. Um, I find it, it's my mandate, right? I walk into a classroom and that is perspective that I bring. And whenever I'm looking at a syllabus or I'm looking at the content of our social work programs, which is pretty prescribed, right? We have to kind of stick to certain things. Um, that doesn't mean it needs to be taught from one perspective. And my goal is to always bring in CRT, relying on the tenants, right? Um, which some of you may know about, some of you may not, um, but there are several tenants that guide this work. And I use that um, to reconstruct a syllabus that creates space um, for everybody to start to do some um, introspective and investigative work to understand how systems of privilege and systems of, of racism are embedded within ourselves and then how we go out and perpetuate that um, in, in our work as social workers, in our agencies, how our agencies are then doing that as part of a system and ways that we, you know, above that can really start to dismantle that and, and helping students to see their responsibility. Um, and then last, and, and I'll turn it back over, um, is that, CRT really allows me when I'm working with students and, and other faculty in contexts like this to um, interrogate the way in which social work as a profession is inherently racist and oppressive. And we have a responsibility to do that. 
um, and to really um, start to try to dismantle that. You know, we're sort of at a point of reckoning, it seems like, in in the profession. Um, but a lot of us have been have been thinking about this for a long time and thinking about how to do this. And CRG gives me the framework to actually be able to do that and to bring students into the fold in doing that. And I I love it. I mean, I could I could talk about this for hours. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you all so much. Again, thank you so much to each of our panelists for giving your introductions. Um, we are so excited to have you here. And so uh, our first question that we have is, how do you implement CRT in institutions that don't include CRT in their policies and procedures on a micro, meso, macro level? And I'm gonna go ahead and assign Dr. Wilner to go first for this. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, so I'm gonna talk about it a little bit from a research perspective from my own research, right? Um, I sit in the, um, and then I'm gonna talk about it in terms of teaching because that's my practice space, right? I'm not a practitioner. My job as a social worker is to educate social workers. Um, that's the path that I've taken. And so, and I'm very proud of that. And I love that role, um, but that's essentially my practice. I'm not out in, the field anymore, as as many of you are, and and you know I miss it, but I'm I'm okay with that, um, because social work students are really um, that's where my my passion is, in addition to my research. So first, I'm going to talk about it in terms of my research. Um, I think it's really you know research critical spaces in research are marginalized, right? As critical spaces are in pretty much every sphere, right? Um, those of us doing critical work, whether you're using CRT or any other forms of critical theory, which I use um, other forms of critical theory as well, um, are often sidelined and marginalized. They're not considered rigorous, um, you know, especially those of us who use critical theory and then do qualitative research on top of it. We're further marginalized. Um, and I don't really, I don't buy that um, at all. I think that there is a very central place for critical, in, critically informed research and qualitative research that is furthering that critical research. And so um, I use it to really not just think about, um, again, I, I sit at this intersection of social welfare and organizational studies, right? I am studying the organizations that you are all out doing your work in to find out what's going on there um, and, and what is perpetually, um, disadvantaging our, our clients and our communities, despite the fact that we have all of these incredible intentions as, as organizations and as practitioners. And there's a systemic issue here, right? Um, and so I use CRT to really look at and examine those systemic issues and why our organizations are, are shaped the way they are. Who are they accountable and why, right? Accountable to and why? What, um, what systems are, dictating the way that our organizations get to be structured or not, what dictates legitimacy, right? Who gets to decide who is legitimate, what is legitimate? And I use CRT, um, particularly lenses, so I'm gonna get into the tenants a little bit here, um, the lens of interest convergence, and then as an offshoot, interest divergence, right? Which is sort of an offshoot of the interest convergence lens, which is really just very simply the idea that the dominant group who holds power um, is not going to move to make any change whatsoever unless their power is threatened in some way, right? And so um, we can think of this summer as a real example of interest convergence, right? It was no longer acceptable to watch somebody have a knee on their neck for several minutes and to die. It was no longer acceptable for dominant people to watch George Floyd expire in that way. If you did accept that, then you were no longer gonna be on the right side of history, right? So people in, in positions of power were automatically or, or, or kind of, they were forced to really start to reckon with this in a way that they ha perhaps hadn't been before we reached a tipping point, right? And so you were like, am I gonna be on this side or am I gonna be in that side of history, right? That's a perfect example of interest convergence. All of a sudden now everybody is out looking to, to achieve racial justice in some way, shape, or form, which again is, is wonderful. I'll take it, right? Um, but again, providing, providing that we're thinking about it critically and using lenses like CRT to really inform that. Um, so that's an example of interest, of interest convergence, right? The dominant group is um, only going to shift and make a change when they see their power threatened. And I really use that in my research to understand how organizations shift or change or don't shift or change and issues of of legitimacy in organizations. So that's one piece. Um, in my teaching, as I mentioned before, I find this to be an incredibly useful way of teaching social work. 
um, and students are really excited about it. Um, it seems like there is also a tipping point happening, at least in California, um, from what I can tell. Um, you know, there's a lot of schools that are really looking to this right now. And, and I think that um, having our social workers go out into the field with critical perspectives on issues of race and racism and inequity is only a good thing, right? Um, it, it can only lead to positive change in the field. And so I really rely on it, um, particularly tenants of intersectionality, um, of thinking of racism. Um, you know, we tend to think of racism as an aberration, not something that is um, embedded in our, in our lives. Um, and so I really use these particular tenants to, um, to break all of these ideas open for students so that they can start to um, think about how these theories, the theory, and then in turn, use it in terms of praxis, right? So thinking about the way to merge theory and practice um, as they go out into the field. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and pass it on to the next panelist. Thank you, Dr. Wilner. Let's um, move, on, move on with Nicole. Great, thank you. Um, so the, the question is, how do you implement CRT in institutions that, are, that don't include CRT in their policies and procedures? Um, so I think that you can't just go in and, you know, start like, this is CRT, let's do it, y'all. You know, like, mm, no, people aren't gonna, you know, be about that. Um, and like thinking about, you know, the audience here, thinking about students and our alums that I see that are, you know, relatively recent alums. And this is what I would tell my students when I was at Dominguez is like, use the fact that you're a student and you're a learner or that you're new as an asset and come in and that enables you to go in and ask questions. So if you see something that in your head is like this intake form is effed up and it's wrong and it only includes two options for gender and, you know, three options for race, like, you know, in your head, you're like, this is so effed up and so marginalizing, right? But then you can use your role as that learner or as someone that's new just to ask the questions. You know, like, have we ever thought about maybe adding or how would someone who's, you know, trans, where would they, you know, check on this box? Um, or, you know, how about someone who identifies racially or ethnically this way? How might they, um, you know, check off this box, right? So like you're coming in with your CRT lens because, I was part, I was uh, watched another um, uh, workshop panel yesterday, I think it was. And, you know, someone was saying that in the, and they asked the question it's like, and I, and I feel like a lot of us are in these spaces where like, you feel like you're preaching or like you say something and it just like falls flat. And there's like radio silence because nobody else gets it. Right. Um, and so it's important to kind of to, to know your audience too when you're going in and that's where like my macro I think social work skills come in is like assessing the situation before you go in um, finding your people for one and and then having a sense of like where folks are so if they're not even close to being there yet like maybe that's where you start to ask questions you know um, and then hopefully that opens up some sort of a conversation um, I think for you know faculty that, that may be here, um, it could be the same way, but it could ask, and I'll also say like, use your students and like students, please hear this too. Like if you're trying, as a faculty member, if you're trying to create change in your program, uh, administration will respond if you say like, our students are pissed because they, you know, they aren't getting this, you know, because that just means that the reputation is going to get out there and people aren't going to apply to your school. People aren't going to apply to your program and that gives students and potential students the power right so if you're a prospective student you're asking those questions like what type of what is your how to what extent does um your curriculum infuse critical race theory to what extent does your curriculum is racially or um, social justice you know focused right again if you're a faculty member and people aren't getting where anywhere and they're not listening in terms of administration do um a climate survey um, and then you can say like, look, because I will guarantee you students will be honest about what, you know, how they feel in the classroom, how they feel about the curriculum. And then you can point to that and say like, look, this is what students are saying that they need. Um, so my, my time is up, so I'll, I'll move on. Thank you, Maribel. Thank you so much, Nicole. That is very powerful. Coming from a student perspective, I think that, you know, when our professors 
could advocate in that way, it really does, <laughs> makes a difference. I wanted to quickly share that um, we are um, giving the panelists about three minutes. So um, once I do um, put the reminder, it's just that you have one minute left. And I apologize for that, but we are so excited to hear you. Um, so uh, I would like to give um, the microphone to uh, Dr. Paris. Awesome. All right, Maribel, I'm going to be watching for my green one minute sign. <laughs> <laughs> I see you, hun. OK, so the question of how do I implement CRT in institutions that don't include it? I really think that this is a simultaneous process, right? If we are working towards a more equitable field and a society, then we can't just look at it as micro, meso, macro. We have to know that all of this needs to happen together, right? And so in that idea of taking care of your part of the ocean, your part might be macro, but partner with folks who are meso micro, right? So we all work together in this idea. Um, also, I am huge on language. I am big, big, big on language. And I ask tough questions, not only of myself, but of other people and why they use particular language the way they do, right? So for example, using the word minority instead of people of color, when we actually know that minority means smaller number and we are not, right? So checking people in, in that meeting where they say, you know, minority students, you mean students of color, and you don't have to be ugly about it. You don't have to be um, kind of in your face about it, but checking that and also using your language to model that because we know that sometimes people don't catch it if you just cut them off in the meeting but if they're hearing you say it um then they'll they'll catch on another example is in class for example when students use the word caucasian instead of white because they're afraid to say the word white for whatever reason right you know i give them some history right caucasian just like negro and negroid is rooted in eugenics which is this whole problematic history that we are built in a hierarchy hierarchical system so correcting those language and really challenging people not just in their conversations but also in their writing and then i sit on a number of community boards as well much like dr wilner i have chosen after 17 years of being in practice my practice area now is in the classroom and i'm honored and privileged to have that space right i feel like i have more of an opportunity to impact multiple people in the classroom space um, but on the community boards I sit on, you know, I'm specifically asking questions about their data and how they are thinking about their people of color in the community. You know, working with community boards to work on policy and diversity and equity and justice statements. And then for it not to just be performative, but how are we investing our time, talent and finances into whatever initiative this board has taken on. And so with that, I think that helping them see it, got it, Maribel. I think that helping them with their um, statements and how to actually implement that really helps. But then also sometimes just my presence as a Black woman is disruptive to that space and recognizing and owning. And it's not always comfortable to be that disruptor in that space. But having my tribe, as Nicole pointed out, to help guide me and support me as I'm moving along in those efforts, those are some of the ways I bring it to people who aren't aware of CRT. Thank you. Now let's go ahead and pass it on to Susana. Thank you. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ebony. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. And, and also, you know, I want to take a moment because as, I, as I'm sitting around and, and I'm just really learning and taking everything, um, really recognizing right everything that we're talking about and, and, and we have this, this very like, well, you know, organized, beautiful Zoom um, experience is that why we're here is because people are dying. Um, people are dying all the time, every day. And so so the state is act actively coming after us, after people. And so really, you know, beyond CRT, beyond social work, right? But, but CRT and social work being a tool and a space that we're in is, is getting all these tools and really finding our people and really rooting in why are we doing this and for what? 
Um, and so I'm getting emotional because this is the work that, that I've been doing and that CRT has led me to, um, is I really need to dismantle these systems inside of me, in my body, because we have internalized deeply, so deeply. Um, and so I'm rooted in grief right now. I'm rooted in ancestors right now because this work cannot be done without all of us and without just really getting to like the root, right? That's why I want to do radical everything, radical kinship, radical acceptance, radical love. Right? We got to get to the root. And so for me, CRT has helped me just dig and just more and dig and dig to the root. And so, but CRT was also limiting. And so is this field. This field is deeply traumatic. It's deeply hurtful and painful and brutal. So where I sit, I sit and I see my fellow social workers who I maybe supervise, who I maybe consult with, but I'm going into organizations doing healing justice work because people are constantly being hurt in the nonprofit world, harming conflict, right? And even more so now in these high, high times of stress and terror. And so now I'm seeing it, I'm seeing the micro, meso, mac, all of them, right? Like it's all of it right there. And then I'm seeing it in the individual sessions, right? I'm seeing it with, 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 with my people. They are my brothers, they are my sisters. I also have to see people as, as a part of me, right? Every time someone dies, right? And more and more and more when these immigrant mothers were taken so brutally, right? That's us, right? Like that, that, that's here, that's in our body. And so we know how to reproduce dominance. We know how to be colonizers and, and, and oppressors and police. We know how to police the shit out of ourselves and the shit out of our kids and the shit out of our clients. And so that we, we need to get to here. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really um, serious about this work, but this work cannot happen if we're just here intellectualizing this. We can't program ourselves out of poverty. We can't intellectualize our way out of this because I, I'm not in any institution. I don't have a boss how I used to. I don't have coworkers how I used to. But let me tell you, it was real quick. It took me a matter of three weeks to reproduce all, my, all the power dynamics of patriarchy, of capitalism, of white supremacy, of heteronormativity, everything with myself, in my body, in my four walls. So uh, how you do CRT or how you implement it right here and with all your relationships, be right with yourself and be right with your relationships and be right with the earth and be right with ancestors. Thank you, Susana, that is so powerful. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on to our second question, which is, um, I think that um, we've already heard some of this as well as all of the panelists spoke, but how do you encourage other social work, social workers and social work students to implement CRT into their work? So we'll go ahead and start with Dr. Paris. Thanks, Madam Bell. Um, so I think one of the ways that I encourage uh, CRT is to make sure that people understand that, right, social work practice is reflective and introspective. As Susana, who is giving me all the feels right now, um, I wish I could hug her. I'm sending you a virtual hug, Miha. Um, you know, we often talk about things such as evidence-based practice, right? So social workers in the room understand that evidence on who? Who have you based this evidence on, right? So asking these Socratic questions in class because students are really looking at us um, to, to move beyond the hashtag, right? To recognize that we need to co-create knowledge and that that knowledge is not just housed in the academy, it's just hot, not housed in white spaces and white supremacy and white practices, that it's housed within all of us. That that connection to First Nations people is solid and important. That that connection to the fact that there were black bodies who built these institutions that were not built for us, but here I am, is important. That you need to understand all that and then reflect on that historical knowledge and understand that we have a responsibility and an excellence to push through and to do better for those who are coming after us. I tap into my students' creativity. When you're in the K-12 system, we have spent 13 years pushing creativity out 
of you. And so I get college students who come in and I ask them to be creative and they're like a deer in headlight. No, that does not mean put together a PowerPoint. I wanna see something different. I want you to put on a social campaign. You all are on social media all the time. What would that look like if you use that space in order to move things forward and to resist the status quo? So really tapping into that creativity because to me, creativity is where innovative thought comes from. It's where solutions come from. It's where we get rid of the same old, same old. And I want to expose students to stories of various lived experiences, right? It just doesn't mean that Jane Addams is not, you know, the end all to be all to social work history. Who are the other voices historically in social work who can help us move forward? Have you learned from your classmates, right? And it doesn't necessarily even always have to be out in your face. In human behavior, for example, I use um, a particular TED talk where it is a black cisgender female physician who is merely presenting her counter story about her experience learning about ACEs, right? And what childhood trauma means. But the message, the delivery that it is coming on from give students a different perspective in order and then i challenge them what did you think and i will specifically ask in my hip-hop and social justice class that i teach i say what do you think about that body what do you think about that music what do you think about the fact that there are black women who are talking about you will never take my power what does that mean and how does that intersect with social work practice so those are some of the ways and i saw my little card so i'm gonna shut up those are some of the ways that i use it in the spaces. Maribel, thank you. You are doing excellent. I am not offended. <laughs> thank you so much. I love, I love, love, love hearing this passion and it's just so contagious and it really, I hope that all of the students and everybody, you know, is feeling all of your energy because I am definitely, and I hate to cut you off. This is, <laughs> but let's go ahead and um, Nicole. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so for uh, half of my time, I'm going to yield my time to what you all already now know is the amazing Susana Parras to answer that question. And then I'm gonna, um, oh, I gotta turn my volume all the way up and then I'll, I'll follow up. Explain like what incorporating CRT <laughs> in social work practice actually looks like. I think for me too, it also means continuously assessing my points of privilege and power and my positionality of privilege and power that even just the, even when someone is, is in front of me as my client, that I as a social worker, just that title of it in, in, in and of itself already carries a big history. Um, it has a lot of power. It, I'm not just a helping professional coming in to, you know, um, help them, you know, feel better about themselves psychologically and emotionally, but that I have to continuously be aware, what is my position and my, as a social worker, as a therapist, what does that mean to this person in front of me? Because that history isn't, isn't neat, you know, that history of social work, that history of mental health is very oppressive and has been very oppressive to communities of color. And so I feel that I'm continuously having to see, am I being complicit in a system of oppression here? Am I, am I oppressing, you know, this person in front of me in any way? Am I imposing something because of my position of power? It really implies that you have to kind of really open yourself up personally and really look into, yeah, am I being racist? Am I being patriarchal? Am I being, you know, homophobic? And, and that, that doesn't feel good to people. And so I think that I, and that's important for me to do, you know, to be a better practitioner, I have to continuously be opening myself up, of course, in safe spaces, but, you know, um, see your So I just wanted to share that because um, that is so critical and crucial and important. I mean, if all of you are inspired for those by those of us here on this panel today, it's because we've done that work and we continue to do that work. Like Susie was crying and like, uh, it, you know, it's hard for me not to get emotional as well because like we eat, live and breathe this. And that means that we've done the super hard work and looked like I say, like looked at our dirty insides to see because this, 
system, capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy is so huge that we're all complicit in it. And we have to be honest with ourselves about how we maintain that those systems and those structures. And also to be, you know, easy on ourselves, like understanding like that we're a part of this, but I'm just, we still have to do the work, regardless of how woke you think you are, regardless if you're the same skin color as the person that's sitting across from you as your client or the person that you're trying to, you know, work with to create a policy or something like that. No, um, you know, when I was field director and I had an um, agency reach out to me and tell me that the student was having problems, instead of looking, and because that's, you know, CRT, right, is that critique of liberalism and the focus on the individual, um, is not thinking about like, okay, well, this student is, is doing something wrong. What's wrong with them? I've thought about like, well, what's happening at the organization? You know, is this field instructor a different race, age, gender than the student? And what is that, what effect is that having on them? Or when a student is struggling in class, it's not like, what is the problem with that student? How am I, in a, what am I doing in my classroom that's causing the student to feel this way? It's putting their, we, that's the part that's so hard. And like, as a consultant, people want me to come in and help them with stuff. And it's like, I tell them like, you've got to look at your dirty insides. And that's what we don't want to do. We don't want to do that as social workers because we're coming in to help other people. And I think it's been said already, like we're not going to help anybody until we look at ourselves and we see like how we've perpetuated it. And that's what CRT does for me too, is it helps me understand. And Susie also in that video was a clip from a um, video, that clip was a video from a video on Dominguez Hills website. Um, and in that video too, she, you know, she says it helps me understand it without making me feel like I'm the worst person in the world. Cause we're understanding that how can I, how can I not be, you know, as a queer person, how can I not have internalized homophobia when, you know, you like, I just read a story. I'm sorry, I just keep talking, but I just read a story in the LA Times the other day about this college students who are being forced back into the closet when they come back home that have had to come back home because of quarantine. And I'm like, damn, like we're still dealing with this, you know? And we have to do the work internally ourselves and really like we will see the, the transformation that it makes when we focus inward, we'll see the transformation that it makes in our work and the effect that we have, not only with our clients, but the institutions that we're working in. Thank you, Nicole. Dr. Wilmer. Oh man, there's so much that was just said. Um, okay, so, so the question is how I use CRT with my students in, in, in the classroom, correct? Just wanna make sure that I'm, um, answering the question and staying on track here. How do you encourage other social workers or social I, students to implement CRT? Okay. So um, for me, I think a lot of this is also about positionality and helping students to really understand their positionality. Um, both myself, as I come into the classroom, what privilege I bring, um, what I, I don't bring, and really kind of trying to break it down in a way that we often feel is assumed and that, that there's an assumption that this happens in a social work classroom simply by the very nature of this being social work, right? That this work is automatically happening. Um, and what we know, many of us know, is that that actually doesn't happen um, unless it's intentional, right? Um, and as I mentioned before, I start um, with um, my syllabi, right? So what am I putting out there? How am I incorporating this into the actual things that I'm giving students to read? How am I making sure um, that people of color are represented in, in my syllabi, in what I'm asking students to think about and engage with each week? Um, how am I making sure that these critical perspectives are coming to the forefront and then they're not simply just one week of a, of a, a, of a syllabus and a class, which is really important, right? I'm sure many of you have experienced a class where one week you're talking about LGBT folks, the next week you're talking about black folks, then you're talking about Latinx folks, and it's like this mix and stir, right? And then somehow you get to the end of this class and you're all supposed to understand the plight of everybody and be able to go out into the world and somehow do something with this. When in fact, you're actually just more confused than you ever were before because you haven't taken the time to understand where you're complicit in this, right? And, and where you're not. Right, a big thing about CRT is the counter narrative, right? It's the counter storytelling. And so much of what we need to do in the classroom and what I do with my students is reconfiguring the space to be able to not just tell, have students be able to, to 
engage in counter narrative, but to create a counter narrative about our profession, right? We need that. Um, we know that this profession has been whitewashed. We know that our history has been whitewashed, that um, folks of color who've contributed to this field are completely erased and eliminated from the history, right? Someone mentioned Jane Addams. Um, you know, that's not to say that that history is not important, but there's a whole piece that's missing. And without bringing that into the space um, for students to really kind of grapple with and engage with and not just learn about, oh, there's another piece to this, but why is this being eliminated? Who benefits from it being eliminated, right? How does this serve to maintain power structures by actually eliminating this, right? And then how does this then, in, you know, support social work in being part of that system, right? And so um, for me, it's, it's very much about how to integrate it on a weekly basis and allow students to be part of that counter narrative storytelling in ways that often feel really challenging at a personal level that really kind of, you know, you got to show you're dealing with the dirty stuff inside, right? I mean, and it's, it's not always pleasant and it's not easy, right? But, but there's, you know, if students come into this space and are able to grow even just a little bit from being exposed to these ideas and given, being given the opportunity to just engage and to use their brain in a different way. CRT really, really supports creativity. Um, as um, Dr. Perez was saying, it, it really supports creativity. And I am so much um, in favor of students using that creativity to um, engage in those counter narratives and be part of creating the future counter narrative of what social work is all about. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Susanna? Thank you, everyone. Oh, I loved it. Um, so where you all landed me was really just um, re remembering uh, it, uh, my connectedness to my intuition. Um, so my intuition in my center <clears throat> and kind of just, you know, so, uh, one of you I think had said, or, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Ebony had said like the, the by the time they, they get to, to, you know, to, to higher education that that creativity is gone. And so I think for me is that my vulnerability is my creativity or, or my, my vehicle or the way that I create. Um, and CRT is one tool, one tool. Um, and, and the relationships again is another, actually is a center for me. Um, and so intuition, because what, what, when I look at myself within this power privilege wheel web is that I'm actually very close to that center. Um, I embody, right? I, I move through the world in very normative ways. And so I, I take that responsibility very seriously. That also means that I make room for what has been taken from me and really bring in joy, really bring in like love and, and, and laughter. And that's what I've learned. And really that's what, where I am in this moment um, in the spiral of, 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 of this journey is that I, I'm in expansiveness right now. And that is really what this work gives us, right? And so how I encourage you is, is, is stay close to people, to, to professors, to field faculty, to colleagues, to, to anyone that really is aligned with, your, with, with what is here and what is intuitive for you. I just finished teaching um, uh, this, one, this course at UCLA and, and at the end where they were so grateful that they felt that they could just come in and just be however they needed to be, right? That, that really what we're, what we're needing is just more spaces where we can just be fully human, right? And really, really be in, in the wholeness of ourselves. So that means like all the crusty parts, right? All the dirty laundry that comes with you, but, but we're creating. So where I'm coming in in this work, because I want to stay in my lane and I want to work with, with folks is that I'm creating safe spaces, creating safe spaces of, of ownership, of accountability, of dignity, of, of ancestral connection, of, of all the things, right, that, that are goodness to us, right, that, that nourish us. And so we also, we create life, right? We create life and life-giving practices, right, that really people want to be seen, right? Um, one of my greatest interventions, and I'm saying it very sarcastically, was to a, 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 a beautiful being that, that I still stay in touch with, um, Gustavo. And and Gustavo was in deep pain at 16. And I had to, you know, do all the social worky stuff that I needed to do. And at the end of the day, this, this young man needed a rest. He was tired. And so my greatest intervention was a nap. 
right? So we need rest, right? Like we need, we need spaces that where our nervous system can come in and rest and digest where, where, where right now I'm sure I want you to notice how your nervous system is. Where, where are you? Are, are you in fight, flight, freeze, fawn? Are you, are you, are you in your, where are you? Right. And so really understanding that our body, everything happens through the body. We experience life and death through the body. And so, so, so to not be vulnerable and to not be guided by here is that systems take this and really disconnect us. The design of all of this is to deeply disconnect us from everything, from history, from cultural practices, from lands, from spirit, from our bodies. So we have to come back home. So how you come back home is going to be your journey. But here we are, micro, mezzo, macro people here. Someone's in the institution over here. Someone's in like the community space over here. Someone's in like the consulting over here. So we need all of us and we, and you need to be guided. We need to be guided by here, by here, life, life to really fight for the living and honor the dead. That is, that is where I want to be in this work. And so that's what I encourage you. So it's open. You got options. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I am so speechless. Um, again, so we're going to go ahead and move it on with, um, to Dre. Uh, we're going to allow the Q&A sec, um, section of this um, panel. Again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the powerful words for your participation. Hey, oh, there we go. Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, I do have a plumber currently in my bathroom, so I'm very sorry about the background noise. I uh, will try to be loud and clear. So I just before we move on, I do want to just say thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for sharing everything y'all just shared. Um, not just wisdom, not just uh, you know, sharing advice, but also obviously sharing in your, your experiences, your lived lives, your lived trauma, and how you've grown and healed and how you've manifested that into actual healing and helping others. And that's, it's, it's really been, a, a, I'm very humbled and it's been a big pleasure um, being, a, being present. So thank you again. Um, we got some really awesome questions in the in this chat, so I'm very excited to ask you all these, but I'm going to, um, for the sake of making sure we're on time, um, we're going, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask specific panelists the different questions, if that's all right. Um, is that all right? Okay, cool. So, um, the first question I'm going to have for, let's have for uh, Susana and Dr. Perez. Yeah? Okay. So the question is, in what ways can social workers who are engaged in justice work be guided by the desire to preserve racialized life as opposed to death? Um, so whoever, who, who would like to go first? Kevin, can you help me st distill that question? <laughs> yeah, I'll type it. I'll type it right <laughs> I need help. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Dre, I, I think I might have it. So how can social workers who desire to preserve life over death I think that's where we're at. How can they be guided in that work towards preserving life? I just typed it. It's in the chat box. Okay. So I'm glad you gave this both to myself and Susana because she can help me kind of deconstruct this as well. <laughs> um, so I think that when we're talking about doing justice work in general, right, that's the purpose of justice work is to radically preserve life, no matter what 
that life is how that life is racialized i should say right so we have to remember that race is a social construct so it biologically it doesn't exist i know i'm preaching to the choir here and yet has significant impact on our systems on our structures and things of that nature and so when we're looking at preserving life i think one of the biggest things hopefully that folks take away is that this thing belongs within us to all of us to move forward and that that is the entire goal is for healing wholeness and health whatever that may look like right so i can't i also can't impose my version of health on someone else right so there's a lot um that goes into that perseverance of life in general i think all life is racialized even white life we don't talk about it like that but White folks have been racialized as well. And the fact that we disentangle them from the conversation of race is problematic in a number of ways. And so how do we basically untangle all of that or keep us all in the same you know, pool is to continue to have these conversations around race that include all of us, that center all of us as racialized being, but talk about the inequitable ways that we are impacted by the meaning that is ascribed to our individual racialized selves. And I'll give it over to Susana on that. Oh, that was that was that was just right. I I would add I would like to add to that if um but well, I guess that's that's what makes me think about the role of abolition, um because as I you know I'm I'm a learner of it I'm I'm a I'm a young learner in abolition and and but I'm but I'm very attuned and connected to the to the values of abolition and so where I am I, I'm understanding that like you said, Ebony, that no matter how that life comes, what, what the packaging of, of us is, is that we, we have a responsibility to preserve life. And so it, it, it then makes me think about the, the what worlds we can imagine together, because, you know, I, I was just listening to a conversation with uh, Dr. Mimi Kim from Cal State Long Beach um, on uh, uh, abolition, abolition is social work. Um, and so in that, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I, this is connected somewhere, but that that it really heightening the contradictions as, as my partner, I have the privilege of having a, 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 a scholar PhD as a partner. Um, so I'm constantly engaging in, in not as, a, as a, an academic, but but as a practitioner with these theories, but in that work of abolition of um, that, that we build relationships here. And I think with that that's where I, I can't stress that enough of like, who are our, 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 our folks, right? Who are our people? And so I want to make sure that who I'm doing this work with is, is going to also be in, in, in connection with my values of preserving that life. And so I guess, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's, it's that solidarity is, is really building accomplices, right? And beyond like performative optical allyship, you know, it's that beyond the social media is that you need people to be with you to, to the end, right? But, but that's only gonna be through this vulnerability and this relationship building to really know to listen in on this. Um, and so it's, yeah, I, I guess I just wanna add that. And I, yes, thank you, <laughs> keep going. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me, I, I you know, I want to ask this question. It was also one of the Q&A questions, um, but I, I'm really interested in, in hearing an answer to this personally. Um, we've been hearing so much good, you know, abolitionist like you know digging 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 and it's uh it's really really fruitful um but one of the questions that was in the pose in the chat was you know how do you navigate spaces that seem open but really it's performative and it puts the target on you as the person who's actually invested in this work and so i'm going to ask this for um uh, Dr. Wilner and Nicole. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Can, so let's have Nicole go first. Yeah. <laughs> I totally felt like a student there because I was like, "Don't ask me. Don't ask me. Don't ask me." <laughs> that's a tough one. That's a that's. Who? Yeah, but uh, people ask that question a lot. Um, that's hard. Um, We've talked a lot about self-preservation, I think, in, in different ways, and you've used different language for it. 
Um, and you know, when, when folks say like, find your people, like find your community, that is absolutely 100% necessary because you can't do this alone. Like going for the, you know, that's not the critique, that's the critique of liberalism, right? Like there's, there is no like, you know, individualistic behavior, like it just doesn't exist. So you, we can't do it alone, one. Um, and also I would say, you know, you have to be strategic about how you, you know, approach this, right? So again, like the, the community, the little experience I have in community organizing and the macro side of me, like do a power analysis of like, where does the power lie and how far, I mean, it's a grid. So like who has what levels of power and where are they along their journey in terms of like being on board with where you are. And then those are the folks that you target. Right, so you have to be very strategic about it, um, and you know, like the folks that are saying I'm all about it are are likely not. And you know, we can read through them, right? Like they're not going to be further like that far up that scale in terms of like being on your side, right? And very often it's the folks that are like way on your side that don't have a lot of power, and then that's where the strength and strength and numbers comes in too. You know, that's where you get leverage by doing a survey because like who's going to say no to like do a survey doing a survey of students, right? And then you get these results back and like how are we going to ignore what students are saying for one, right? Um, so like also you like you can't fight these folks like if people are like oh yeah I'm all about it you're not going to call them out and be like no you're not you're racist as hell because <laughs> no one likes to be called racist right like that's not going to work either um so and again like you know this CRT panel so that's what and I think Lauren talked about it how like CRT helps us uh, like you can't also ignore history and facts it's like when we talk about that racism is endemic that it's socially constructed all of this like these are facts like these are scientific facts that racism is, or that race is socially constructed right like you can't ignore that you can't ignore that laws if Georgia freaking just passed a law, you know, like voter suppression out the, like you can't ignore that. Um, so when you frame it also in terms of like facts, so this is kind of like spoon feeding. So to answer that question, like, like go with them, like, great, you're with me, great. Like let's, you know, then you have to kind of like spoon feed it and work, work with them in that way. And then like, you just keep working, but sometimes too, like, it can get to the point where it's like, this is harmful and this is hurtful and this is toxic to me and I have to go. Um, and I, I recognize and I'm, you know, I, not everybody has that luxury, um, but I mean, I know folks that have left jobs for lower paying jobs um, because it was, it, it, they had to do it to save their soul, literally. Um, so, I mean, these are the choices that we have to make. Sorry, Lauren, I don't know how much time I've left you, but. No, that's okay. Um, I'm, I feel like you took many of the words right out of my mouth. Um, but um, I'm gonna go right back to, for me, right? And I can only speak to my experience doing this, um, which is likely very different than a person of color who comes into these spaces, right? Um, and so again, I have a little bit of an advantage in this respect um, that needs to be acknowledged because when I think the question says, you know, at the end, which then puts the target on you, right? Um, the target looks very different when it's on me than it does when it's on people of color. Um, and that's really important to acknowledge. And when I say use that to my advantage is that I get to enter spaces in a way that people of color do not, right? I walk into a space very differently and I understand that I have a responsibility to use that in a way that is going to um, push people, right? That would perhaps not be done, be able to be accomplished in the same way. Um, if you know a, a, a person of color comes into a space to say a predominantly white group, right? The target is automatically on you no matter what, right? And so, um, going back to kind of this very basic idea of, you know, in social work, we teach you right when you walk in the door, you got to meet people where they're at, right? Um, and I really kind of walk into spaces as frustrating as it can be, but I have to meet everybody where they're at and they may not be where I want them to be. And they may never get to that point, right? But if I'm starting where they are, rather than where I want them to be, then my frustration gets lessened, right? And I'm able to make inroads however long that may take, and they may move just a tiny little bit, 
right? But even that tiny little bit is better than not moving them at all. And again, I need to acknowledge that like, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm, I exist differently in the space for better or for worse, right? And so um, I've had experiences where I will literally say the same thing as a colleague of color and it's received very, very differently, right? And that's just the reality of it. And that sucks um, for my colleagues, but I have a responsibility, an even greater responsibility to then call people out on that and to allow people to understand what that looks like and how that is part of the equation and that's part of the problem, right? Um, so, you know, every space looks different. Every organization looks different. Every department looks different. Every school looks different. And so there's no one size fits all to this. So this, this is part of the reason why this work is so taxing on those of us who do it, because every time you come to the table, you got to find a new solution, right? You got to find a new way to approach it. You got to figure out, um, like Nicole said, you do a power analysis, right? Who's got the power and how do you access that power in the space and who doesn't have power and why? If you're doing a power analysis, you're going to understand why the power has been taken away from certain people in that space, right? And, and I see my role in doing this work, especially um, when I walk into spaces where I'm trying to educate, say, right? Um, and, and try to bring people along a little bit, um, figuring out how to interact with those who have power versus those who don't and figure out why that dynamic exists is, part, is the first part of it for me in a lot of ways. So there's a lot of work that you need to do. It's not just simply walking into the space and being like, let me give you all of these amazing ideas um, and let me theorize the crap out of this with you and hope that you understand it, right? It's not, it's not really about that. I'm, I can sit and theorize it about all day because that's who I am and that's what I like to do, right? But I'm not gonna walk into a space and be like, let me throw this theory on you and see what you think about this and see where this lands. 99.9% .9 of the time that theory is not gonna land, right? So I'm going to try to figure out where people are at and how to meet them there in the best way possible um, and just start to slowly move them along and know that sometimes it's not gonna work, right? It's, it's, it's not gonna work. And that's the reason why we're still having these conversations because it doesn't always work. So that's, that's the best answer I have for that. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Uh, we're hitting the end now. Um, there were other really good questions in the chat. I'm sorry, I, I did capture them, but we just ran out of time. Um, but we wanted to do closing statements, um, but right now Dr. Alt is gonna post in the chat an evaluation link. Please, if you attended, please do this. It's super quick. It's like a couple questions. Please do this eval. It's really helpful for us putting on this um, panel, putting on this to make sure we work out more and more, you know, kinks for future panels and make it go smoother and smoother and smoother. So um, it will be in the chat from Dr. Alt. Please do that real quick. Um, and then now we're going to go into closing statements from all the panelists. So let's start off with um, so just, you know, a minute each, please. Um, so let's start off with, uh, let's start off with Susanna. Uh, I felt like the student too, Nicole. I was like, no, no, no. Um, I, you know, I, I really, um, I really just want to really, I guess, acknowledge, um, for me, even just uh, slowing down, slowing down has been a very big teacher. Um, and the slowing down has brought me closer to my, my, my dirty laundry to the, to the, to the places in there. Um, and so I've, I've quickly seen in this time in this pandemic, right? And really acknowledging that, that, that nothing is normal and, and nothing ever was. Um, but that in that, it, it really, I think it really um, helped me to understand the importance of a really upending and uprooting this out of my nervous system, right? Out of my my cells, my my face, my my everything. And so I'm deeply committed to continuing to expand, create, build, um, envision, you know, practices that that really return us to, you know, how Dr. Ebony said, like we 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 have everything. We need we're, we're creative, right? Um, and and so really beginning to 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 really cultivate that um, I think is really important in really learning how to be with all parts of ourselves. 
Um, and then through the work that I do in individual therapy, I get to see, right, that over time, what happens when together we can help return us back to the wisdom of what we oftentimes have packed away and have been deeply disconnected by, it comes in and supports us. So this is where our anger, where our rage, where our shame, where our guilt can really be transformed differently and to move um, um, and, and, and just kind of up and, and, and just keep moving towards life, towards life, towards life. Um, as we keep losing it, as we keep losing lives, as we, as we keep losing loved ones. So I want to just really thank all of you and really what it took to get here and what it takes to still be here in, the, in these times. Um, and, and all who have been lost and are no longer with us and all of us that have loved them and we continue to honor. Um, thank you. It was such a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, doc, let's do Dr. Perez. Thank you, Dre. Um, so I just want to take the opportunity to shout out these amazing students who put this whole thing together. So I appreciate your time, energy, and talent that you put into this. So thank you for that and giving us the space. Um, to my fellow, fellow panelists, thank you. Some of you I'm just getting to know. Others of you are already in my heart. I'm looking forward to locking you down in my tribe. Um, so I would say to... Um, just know that CRT is one tool of many, right? It's just mm -hmm. one tool and it is a tool. And tools are only as effective as we use them, as we unpack them, as we analyze, you know, Nicole talks about doing the power analysis and figuring out what you use when, right? So not all tools are effective for a, a specific job. So mm -hmm. make sure and part of that is our, our knowing how to use the tool, right? I can't just unpack a chainsaw and go at it. I got to know how to use that thing. So make sure you take the time to learn, to get to know, to unpack. But in that, take time and take care to center yourself, be reflective, to understand who you are, what you're capable of, and know that you are more powerful beyond belief, that the people who have tried to write your story have already written you too small, and you don't have to go with that. Change the narrative, change the book. To me, that is a huge part of CRT, that counter story piece. So you get to write your own story. Black, white, Latino, First Nation, queer folk, trans folk, however it is, you get to write your story. Don't do that apologetically. Stand on your own, write yourself, and tell everybody else to go to hell. That's what I got. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was loud. Thank you for that. I was just nodding hard, really. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go to Nicole. It's so hard to follow these amazing people. So again, I just want to say thank you. Um, I love being in community with, with, with all of you. Um, I think like my maybe takeaways are humility and vulnerability. Um, that, cause that shit is scary. That is so scary to put ourselves out there and to be vulnerable. Um, and to be honest, like that is scary. That's some like really scary shit. Um, but we have to do it regardless of who we are, where we stand, what level of power privilege we have. That's what we have to do. I mean, and, you know, going back to Susie's video, like that video clip I've seen multiple times where she's going, we have to open ourselves up. You have to open yourselves up. And she says it, you know, within safe spaces, right? And with people, with your community, but that is so necessary. You have to walk, we have to walk into whatever space that we're in with humility. Um, yeah, just, just this, that with humility and, and have tried to tap into the strength of our ancestors to to be vulnerable um, to step into these spaces because that is so crucial to this work. You want to put your shoes on and come with me, right? Thank you, Nicole. And I just you know said in the chat, y'all are we all are watering us today, and I we, it's deeply appreciated. Thank you, especially for students like us who are about to go into the field. It's really encouraging to know there's a lot of there's a lot of this already you know 
uh, Dr. Wilner, you're going to finish us off. Oh man, that's rough. Put me at the end here. Um, I have to say that I, you know, you find it encouraging, but gosh, I find this so encouraging. I, I'm just sitting here thinking back to, um, I don't know, it had to be 2008, maybe, where um, Dr. Nakaoka and I met um, in a hotel lobby randomly. I'm in Philadelphia and she is in LA. And we meet because we find out that, you know, um, Dominguez is this one program, I co- my, not my colleague, he was my professor, he wasn't even my colleague at the point. We find out that um, there's this random program, random to us, because we don't know anything about the CSUs in Philadelphia at that point, at least I didn't. And but there's this amazing program that has their entire curriculum based off of CRT. And we meet and we're talking and it's just three of us, right? In, in the lobby and how I'm thinking about how far we have come since that conversation and how we um, very randomly also, or maybe not random, maybe it was fate that we wound up in, in Luskin together um, and, you know, and we didn't even know it. Um, but that to sit here and to see all of you in this panel and to see how many students care about this and how many faculty care about this and how many practitioners care about this. Um, you know, it's been, it's been a long road of trying to really kind of convince people that this was a worthwhile way of doing social work. Um, and we don't seem to need to do that much convincing anymore. We are a critical mass at this point, at least that's how I see it. And that gives me life. Right to know that um, I have students who are going to demand this from me um, and from my colleagues, and that is just the most incredible, beautiful thing. And I just look forward to seeing what you are all going to do as you go out into the world and you take this with you. And we continue to organize and continue to make this um, not a marginalized perspective, right? That we bring this to the center um, in a way that is 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 absolutely critical. Our profession depends on it, right? And again, CRT is not the only tool as been mentioned. There are many ways to be critical in your thought and your action and in your practice. And I encourage you all to, to, to do that. Um, but to bring this to the center, because again, I, I really think our profession um, and our, our communities that we work with um, depend on it. So thank you all for being here and for, for giving me life. So, <laughs> This was just so powerful in so many levels. I just want to thank everybody, absolutely all, everybody that came today. Our panelists, um, Dr. Nakioka and Dr. All, who supported us through making this happen. And, you know, everybody who participated and came out and made, you know, their time out of their day to really be here and to really um, feel empowered, whether you're just learning about CRT or feeling connected. Um, and I think that a little of what we should always take from something is, you know, not just leaving it right here, you know, like, what are we, the, the question that I want to pose for everybody is like, how are you actually going to implement this afterwards, you know, um, or you not even implement it, but how are you going to stay connected with yourself? And so um, for me as a teacher, social work, um, CPS worker, you know, that is going to be a real systematic, you know, fighting against everything. And so how I'm going to stay with my beliefs and how I'm, I'm going to include CRT. And I think that, again, thank you. Thank you so much for everybody that was here, um, everybody that participated. So this is all, this is what we have for you. Thank you, everyone.